Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 142 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be babbling away about things that I think are important enough for you to know about. Uh, if you have any comments or questions or reactions to the show, you can contact me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can leave a comment there. Uh, if you do uh, email me, please include a uh, something in the subject line like left side of the aisle or cable show or something so I know it's not spam and be a little patient about getting an answer. You will get one, but sometimes it'll slow about it. All right, I got a bunch of things to get through here today, so uh, let me get right to it. Um, I want to start, as I like to when I can, with some good news. Um, good news is rather hard to come by this week, but uh, at least there was this. On Tuesday, January 14th, U.S. District Court Judge Terrence Kern ruled that Oklahoma's ban on same-sex marriages violates the U.S. Constitution. Kern found that the ban is, quoting, an arbitrary, irrational exclusion of just one class of Oklahoma citizens from a governmental benefit, and that it does not advance the state's claimed interest in promoting heterosexual, ma heterosexual marriage rather, uh, or promoting child welfare. It's the second time in, uh, in a month that a federal court has found that a state-level ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional, despite having been written into that state's constitution. The other case was Utah, of course, you probably recall. Um, the thing is, these courts found correctly that states cannot deny people a right guaranteed by the federal constitution. However, unlike Utah, there will be no opening for uh, same-sex couples to get married, no window of opportunity. Um, in Utah, the judge there uh, refused to stay the effect of his order, with the result that some 1,300 couples were able to get married before the Supreme Court stepped in and stayed the effect of the order pending appeal which was also before, by the way, the state of Utah said that it would refuse to recognize those 1,300 marriages. Uh, because of the way the Supreme Court acted in the Utah case, uh, Judge Kern stayed his order pending appeal. So there's no immediate benefit, but the fact is this is another body blow to the bigots and buffoons. More than 30 states have passed laws or constitutional amendments uh, banning same-sex marriage, restricting marriage to one man and one woman. But the fact is, the constitutionality of all those measures now is under question. By the way, a related bit of good news on this is that even though Utah will not recognize those 1,300 marriages, the federal government will. Attorney General Eric Holder made the announcement on January 10th. Uh, this decision means that uh, those same-sex couples who did manage to get married in Utah will have the same status under federal provisions as those who were same-sex couples who were wed in places where that's now legal. Uh, apparently, based on this and on previous cases, this actually is one area where the White House is determined to be on the right side of history. By the way, if you want an example of those buffoons, uh, it develops that the state of Indiana is now considering a proposed state constitutional amendment to, you guessed it, ban same-sex marriage. The state already bans marriage by law, uh, but uh, the Hoosier Hooies want some more. In fact, more than just some more. This uh, proposed amendment not only bans same-sex marriage, it also bans civil unions and domestic partnerships and denies recognition of such marriages or unions which are performed in states where they are now legal. In fact, the amendment is so broadly worded that the supporters had to come up with a second bill to explain what the first one meant, saying, for example, that it would not repeal human rights ordinances which shows how well they thought through the entire thing. Uh, just as a quick footnote to that, uh, among the opponents of this amendment in Indiana is the Eli Lilly Company. It says it would hurt the company's ability to attract top talent, pointing out the fact that young people really don't have a problem with same-sex marriage. And one other thought on this. 
One of the last ditched arguments raised against marriage justice is that the legal definition of marriage is a matter to be left to the states. Now, by that argument, aren't those people saying that the case of Loving v. Virginia, that was the 1967 Supreme Court decision that banned, that, that struck down, rather, bans on interracial marriage, aren't those people saying that that was wrongly decided and that states should have the authority to ban interracial marriages? All right, while they're, while they're trying to think of an answer to that, we're going to move on to uh, one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. Uh, first of all, before I do that, I have to give a quick update on a previous award. On what you might call my Christmas show a few weeks ago, I dubbed Representative Jack Kingston, a gopper out of Georgia, as the Grinch. Because he was just so morally offended by the fact that some poor kids could get free lunches at school and how they should sweep the floors or something in order to pay for that lunch because there's no such thing as a free lunch, you grade school moochers. Well, it turns out there is such a thing as a free lunch if you're Jack Kingston. An investigation by WSAV-TV in Savannah, Georgia, found that over a three-year period, Kingston and his staff expensed nearly $4,200 in meals to his congressional office. In other words, they didn't pay for those meals. The taxpayers did. Mr. King Grinch also racked up nearly $4,300 in free meals paid for by third-party groups, uh, over $24,000 in total expenses, that is, on congressional junkets in that period, besides expensing out over $145,000 in meals for campaign events. I wonder if any of the attendees at any of those events had to sweep the floors. But, Getting to this week's clown, it is another repeat offender. It's Wisconsin Governor Scott Walk All Over You, who double dipped in the stupid this week. On MSNBC last Monday, he declared his opposition to raising the minimum wage, which, by the way, is supported by uh, something over two thirds of all Americans, including half of Republicans, and in fact, 46% of people who describe themselves as strong conservatives. But he's against it. Because, quoting him, jobs that involve the minimum wage are overwhelmingly jobs for young people starting out in the workforce. The last thing you want to do is to have fewer young people working at a time when unemployment rates are still way too high for teenagers going into their 20s. In other words, minimum wage jobs are mostly filled by teenagers getting their first job at, you know, McDonald's or wherever. Well, bzzzt. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, teenagers make up only a quarter of those making more than minimum wage. Uh, no more than minimum wage, rather. Even giving um, Walk All Over You every benefit of the doubt, and including everyone up to age 24, and assuming all of those people are actually working their first jobs, that still brings the figure making no more than minimum wage to just 50%. While well, those aged 25 to 64 make up 47% of minimum wage workers. But he wasn't done. On Sunday on CNN, he said, quoting, I don't know about you, but if I was out of work, I'd be looking more than twice a week for a job. I'd be looking for work every day, except maybe today. I'd take Sunday off to go to church and pray that I'd find a job on Monday. Yeah. If only all of those unemployed people, all those struggling people draining their savings, emptying their bank accounts, relying on food kitchens to feed their families, losing their homes, if only all those people would actually just try to get a job, if they'd only just pray to get a job, well, then they'd be fine. So if they're out of work, well, it must be their own fault, and so why should we care about them? Now, as a quick footnote, uh, our good governor here it talks a lot about job retraining to deal with unemployment, despite having cut state aid to technical colleges in Wisconsin by 30%. Scott, walk all over you, is such a clown. All right, from there, uh, it's, it's another type of clownishness, you might say. It's an example of what I call unintended humor. This is where something that's not intended to be funny just is. 
Early this month, early in January, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders wrote to the NSA Director General Keith Starship Captain Alexander asking if the NSA has spied on or is spying on members of Congress or other American elected officials. The letter defines spying as including, quote, gathering metadata on calls made from official or personal phones, content from websites visited or emails sent, or collecting any other data from a third party not made available to the general public in the course of normal business. That definition was included because the NSA maintains that collecting such information is not spying. Spying, they say, is only when some particular agent actually looks at an individual record. Well, um, nearly two weeks after sending the letter, Bernie Sanders has now gotten his reply, and of course, it didn't answer the question. Uh, Starship Captain Alexander insisted that nothing the NSA does can fairly be characterized as spying on members of Congress, if you define spying in the narrow and self-serving way that the NSA does. Alexander then went on to say that he couldn't get into it beyond that because, he claimed, he'd be violating the civilian protections of the program if he did. In other words, the NSA, which is now known to be sucking up metadata on tens of millions of domestic phone calls, monitoring web traffic and emails, and so much more, with the avowed, the avowed intent of knowing everything, of being able to track, trace, and record every bit of electronic data transmitted around the world, is now telling a U.S. senator that it can't confirm if he's one of those people whose metadata has been gathered up because doing so would violate his privacy. The lack of self-awareness, sometimes it is just stunning. All right, one last uh, thing before we go on a break. Uh, it's sort of a personal aside, and or you could consider this an update of something I said last week. Last week I mentioned that I'm an atheist and how I resent being told that because of that I am incapable of experiencing wonder or awe uh, by the majesty and beauty of the universe and existence and nature. Well, in the course of that, I mentioned in passing that uh, as an atheist, I'm a member of a community that experiences prejudice, not legal prejudice, but social prejudice. Um, by coincidence, the day after I did the show, I came across an example of that, and so I really decided I wanted to pass it on to you. It starts with the fact that the Morton Grove Park District of Morton Grove, Illinois, had a problem. Last fall, American Legion Post 134 pulled all of its funding, some $2,600 a year, from the Park District because one member of the Park Commission, a guy named Dan Ashta, refused to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ashta said he was doing it to make the point that no one should feel compelled to stand, but the Legion was having none of it. While admitting with some regret, and that's a quote, admitting with some regret that he actually had the right to, to not stand, the Post said it wouldn't contribute any more to the park uh, until either Ashta stands or he's off the board. Well, in response to this, a local teacher named uh, Hemet Mita, uh, Mita rather, who owns a, a blog called The Friendly Atheist, asked his readers to contribute to make up the loss. He raised $3,000. But when he tried to deliver the check to the Park District, it was rejected. In an email to Mita, uh, Park District Executive Director Tracy Anderson said the board has no intention of becoming embroiled in a First Amendment dispute and that the board does not want to appear sympathetic to or show a perceived position for or against any particular political or religious cause and difficulty which does not seem to arise with regard to the American Legion. So Meta tried to give the money to the Morton Grove Library. They, too, refused to accept the donation, with one trustee, Kathy Peters, labeling Meta's blog a hate group and likened it to the KKK based on a scattering of inflammatory anti-religious comments among the 2,000 or so a day that are posted to his Facebook page. After two months and these two rejections, the $3,000 donation has finally found a home. It was accepted by a third group, the Niles Township Food Pantry. 
Niles Township Clerk Charles Levy said the check came in as a contribution and was deposited with the other contributions that came in, which is exactly how the Morton Grove Park District and the Morton Grove Library should have handled it. The thing is, though, even at that, even at that, Niles Township Supervisor Lee T uh, Tamras expressed concern that other donors to the food pantry would now pull their funding, thinking that because they accepted this donation, the pantry was making some kind of political or religious statement. Maida said at one point, I can't believe how hard it is to give away this money. Well, you want to know the truth? I can. We're going to take a break. And we're back. Uh, the rest of the show, I'm going to spend some, uh, some time talking about a couple of things that um, I really think you need to know about. The first of them is our other regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. On Sunday, January 12th, U.S. and Iranian officials announced that Iran uh, and uh, a group of six major nations have reached agreement on the first phase of the deal they've been working on for months regarding Iran's nuclear facilities. The Six Nations, by the way, are the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. That's the U.S., the U.K., France, Russia, and China, plus Germany is the sixth. The agreement was worked out uh, uh, um, in a month of talks between technical experts and diplomats after a preliminary agreement, which was signed on November 24th. Uh, this goes into effect, this agreement goes into effect on January 20th. At that point, Iran will open more of its nuclear facilities to inspection by the United Nations Nuclear Watchdog Agency, the IAEA, uh, in return for which Iran will get access to some of its frozen assets. This also sets uh, a timetable of six months to a year uh, to uh, come up with a um, more permanent long-term agreement. Okay. With that in mind, a couple of things. First, this means that the negotiations are making progress. Neither side has gotten anywhere near all that it wants, but each side has gotten something, and they can live with, the, with, with what's been accomplished so far. Progress has been made. Second, and this is really uh, important, the whole thing, the whole business of sanctions on Iran, the whole business of putting pressure on Iran, uh, on demands that Iran stop working on some nuclear things and slow down work on others, it's all based, at least in the public record, on fears, suspicions, questions, speculations, whatever, that Iran is trying to build a nuclear bomb. Now, the important thing here is that there actually is no solid, no hard evidence that Iran is or ever was trying to do any such thing. But the claims about it go back a long way. In fact, the Christian Science Monitor had a timetable about claims about an Iranian nuclear weapon that actually date back to before the overthrow of the Shah in 1979. The government of Israel has been claiming that Iran is just three to five years away from having a nuclear weapon since 1992. In 1995, the U.S. joined that chorus, saying that Iran could have the bomb by the year 2000. And the warnings, always the same vague three to seven year projection, uh, have been repeated at pretty much regular intervals ever since. Now, the thing is, not only is there no hard evidence that Iran is trying to build a bomb, there is some hard evidence that they're not. Iran has actually converted about a fifth of its partially enriched uranium into a metallic form that's actually good for use in nuclear power plants, but can't be further enriched, so it's no good for building bombs. So... Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that no evidence for and some evidence against. Doesn't matter. It's taken as an article of faith among the American punditocracy that the only reason Iran hasn't nuked Israel and who knows where else is, uh, is because of the constant pressure and hostility from the civilized, which apparently means the non-Muslim, the civilized world. That acceptance, that article of faith, allows U.S. government officials to act as if, yes, that's true, it's absolutely well known that Iran is trying to build a bomb, even though if you ask them directly, they will admit they don't actually have any real evidence of it. 
Okay, put those two things together, the negotiations and the bomb, uh, put them together in your head and continue, uh, continue, continue with this. There is a bill now in the U.S. Senate that would impose a new set of demand on Iran as part of these negotiations, including, for one example, a provision that would reimpose sanctions and add new sanctions unless Iran agrees to dismantle its entire nuclear infrastructure, not just limit its growth, not just have it be done in a way unable to produce nuclear weapons, not even dismantle part of it, dismantle the whole thing. This bill is insane. It is madness. It makes demands that its supporters know. They have to know. They couldn't not know that it makes demands that Iran would never accept. No nation would. Despite that, its backers insist with straight faces that this bill is actually going to help the negotiations. Democrat Bob Menendez calls it a reasonable pragmatism. No, yeah, it'll help the negotiation, sure. The same way being put on the rack will help with your stiff back. It's so bad. This bill is so likely to undermine negotiations that the no-drama Obama White House has actually accused supporters of the measure of having a hidden goal of drawing the U.S. into another Mideast war and demanding of them that if they're going to say that the U.S. should take military action, they should at least be up front and say so. The thing is, despite all that, the thing is, this insane bill is approaching if it doesn't already have a veto-proof majority in the Senate. It has at least 59 co-sponsors, and congressional aides are saying the actual count could be as high as 77, and in any event is well beyond the 67 need to, uh, needed to override a presidential veto. This is madness. Madness driven to a significant degree by right-wingers happy to do whatever they can to embarrass Obama, whatever the cost by extreme right-wingers who are waiting for, waiting for Israel to, to promote the second coming of Jesus, and most importantly, frankly, by sheer craven political cowardice among the Democrats, who are terrified of standing up to the pro-Israel lobby, APAC, and yes, I'm looking at you, Chuck Schumer, I'm looking at you, Bob Menendez, and I'm looking at you, Cory Booker. The fact is, anyone who votes for, anyone who supports this bill is saying, in effect, that they don't want a settlement with Iran. They don't want an agreement. They don't want a peaceful resolution. They may not want outright war, but they don't want peace. They want to be able to maintain Iran as, in a sort of role reversal, Iran the great Satan. They want to have Iran to be the looming, the always on the horizon but never quite here, but still always there, the looming dark cloud, the looming darkness, to be used as leverage for why Israel needs another couple of billion dollars in U.S. military aid and why Israel can't negotiate with the Palestinians. And yes, I'm saying that at least for some of these people, that is exactly why they are doing it. This bill is dangerous and foolish, and the people backing it are dangerous and foolish. It is an outrage. All right, last thing for this week. Net neutrality. This is the principle that all traffic on the internet should be treated equally. Some streaming video from some major media corporation gets the same treatment as that email from your grandmother. It's all the same. Net neutrality is one of the reasons that the internet has grown so far so fast. It's very democratic. It's kind of like, you know, if you will, one bite, one vote. Well, with the rapid growth of broadband, the issue of net neutrality became even more important. Uh, in 2010, the FCC issued long-awaited regulations to that effect, which are designed, in effect, to prevent internet carriers such as Verizon from favoring some traffic over others, favoring, that is, those who could pay the extra fee for the special treatment. Well, on January 14th, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals struck down the rules, arguing the FCC didn't have the legal authority to issue them. The decision came in response to a suit filed by, you guessed it, Verizon, which argued that it should be able to do exactly what net neutrality was designed to prevent, the ability to charge different content providers different amounts of money based on how fast the speed was going to be. 
It also means that uh, those others, the inevitably the smaller, the lesser known, the startup outfits, they're left behind. It's kind of like if all roads in the country were owned by a handful of giant corporations and all of the highways had these big tolls on them, and if you can't afford the tolls, well then you're stuck taking the twisty back roads with all the traffic lights and stop signs and no, the scenery is not worth the trip. Uh, a media watchdog group called Free Press said in response to the ruling that, quote, the biggest broadband providers will race to turn the open and vibrant web into something that looks like cable TV, that is, with like with tiers of service. And what's more, as part of its decision, the court threw out an FCC rule that barred Internet providers from simply banning certain content, certain traffic outright. Which means that the comparison may be even more apt because just like not every channel is available in any given uh, cable system, uh, the carrier here could simply refuse to connect you to certain sites that it didn't feel like allowing you to get to. Now the silver lining in this, if I can call it one, is that the decision was based on what amounts to a technicality. The court found that broadband providers aren't common carriers like telephone companies and so can't be regulated as such under the law. The FCC retains the underlying power to regulate broadband companies, uh, the power that Verizon wanted to strip away. So this could be a matter of just properly reclassifying uh, the companies and so issuing the regulations on a firmer legal basis. And in fact, two of the three judges in the case suggested exactly that. Unfortunately, that would take desire and political will. And the current chair of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, who is a former lobbyist for the telecom industry, seems to lack both. He says the FCC must have the ability to, pre to preserve the net's openness. He says he supports net neutrality. But he also says he doesn't want to regulate broadband carriers, but wants to police them on a case-by-case -case basis. Oh, joy, I'm sure that will work out just as well as it has with the banks. Barring some dramatic turn of events, such as the White House developing a spine or Wheeler developing a conscience or a successful appeal to the Supreme Court, the future of the net may actually be found in the past. You see, some years ago there was a debate about the Fairness Doctrine, which uh, required uh, uh, broadcasters to deal with issues of public interest. The um, corporations fought against this for years, and I used to wonder why, if they say that th this is only something they do anyway, which is why the rule is needed, uh, isn't needed, why are they fighting so hard to get it? Well now, Verizon is assuring us that is that the result of this decision, there will be absolutely no change in what Verizon is doing. Yeah, well, we have been down this road before. We have to make sure we don't wind up in the same place. That's it for this week. You have the best week you can. Peace.